Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I'm so excited to take you down a little rabbit hole I discovered. As somebody that's obviously a big fan of the Law of One, it came to my awareness recently of the references to the Law of One by Edgar Cayce. Somebody had emailed me about it a while back, and I tangentially just kind of looked at it. And then I had ordered a book called Edgar Cayce's Egypt, Psychic Revelations on the Most Fascinating Civilization Ever. So I start perusing this book, and I start to see these references to the Law of One. Almost gave me a heart attack. It sounded like Ra was speaking. A lot of the channelings and information given by Edgar Cayce really is just past life regression done through the Akashic Record. But he would constantly make references. For instance, he'd say the entity was among those of the Law of One who made their departure, not only for the preservation of the material things, but for the preserving of the records that might eventually become portion of man's experience in the earth when there is the seeking into those realms within the inner self for a knowledge of the close relationship with the creative forces. Just out of the blue, it would say something like that. And I scroll back to the index and I just find there's a plethora of information about the law of one. Now this book is amazing because it goes into the history of Egypt, the building of the pyramids and the religious structure and the way they would teach the law of one. So if you do not know about the law of one, let me back up a little bit. It is a channeled work from the eighties and it was channeled by three people, Don Elkins, Carla Ruckert, and Jim McCarty. I have an interview with Jim McCarty. You can check that out. I have a summary of the law of one. You can check that out as well, but essentially it was channeled in the eighties and this entity was essentially an advanced civilization, uh, very, very old that had detailed knowledge and information of the history of the earth and the way the universe works. And they were messengers of what they called the law of one. And so to find the law of one in the description of Egypt is just fascinating. Now we find out in the raw material, which is the original channelings of the law of one of the Egyptian connection to Ra. In the very first session, they ask, I've heard the name Ra in connection with the Egyptians. Are you connected with that Ra in any way? Ra says, I am Ra. Yes, the connection is congruency. May we elucidate. Ra then goes on to say, the identity of the vibration Ra is our identity. We as a group, or what you would call a social memory complex, made contact with a race of your planetary kind, which you call Egyptians. Others from our density made contact at the same time in South America, and the so-called lost cities were their attempts to contribute to the law of one. We spoke to one who heard and understood and was in a position to decree the law of one. However, the priests and peoples of that era quickly distorted our message, robbing it of the, shall we say, compassion with which unity is informed by its very nature. Since it contains all, it cannot abhor any. When we were no longer able to have appropriate channels through which to enunciate the law of one, we removed ourselves from the now hypocritical position which we had allowed ourselves to be placed in and other myths shall we say other understandings having more to do with polarity and the things of your vibrational complex again took over in that particular society complex they also ask in a, the second session could you tell us something of your historical background your earlier times in the illusion and the time state contact possibly your incarnation on this planet that you spoke of before in contact with earlier races on this planet. Then we should have something to start with in writing this book. Ross says, we are aware that your mind body is calculating the proper method of performing the task of creating a teach learning instrument. We are aware that you find our incarnate, as you call it, state of interest. We waited for a second query so as to emphasize that the time space of several thousand of your years creates a spurious type of interest. Thus, in giving this information, we ask the proper lack of stress be placed upon our experiences in your local space-time. The teach learning, which is our responsibility, is philosophical rather than historical. We shall now proceed with your request, which is harmless if properly evaluated. 
We are those of the Confederation who 11,000 of your years ago came to two of your planetary cultures, which were at that time closely in touch with the creation of the One Creator. It was our naive belief that we could teach, learn by direct contact, and the free will distortions of individual feeling or personality were in no danger. We thought of being disturbed as these cultures were already closely aligned with an all-embracing belief in the liveness or consciousness of all. We came and were welcomed by the peoples whom we wished to serve. We attempted to aid them in technical ways having to do with the healing of mind-body-spirit complex distortions through the use of the crystal appropriate to the distortion placed within a certain appropriate series of ratios of time-space material, thus were the pyramids created. We found that the technology was reserved largely for those with the effectual mind-body distortion of power. This was not intended by the Law of One. We left your peoples, the group that was to work with those in the area of South America, as you call that portion of your sphere, gave up not so easily. They returned, we did not. However, we have never left your vibration due to our responsibility for the changes in consciousness we had first caused and then found distorted in ways not relegated to the law of one. We attempted to contact the rulers of the land to which we had come to that land which you call Egypt or in some areas the Holy Land. In the 18th dynasty, as it is known in your records of space-time distortions, we were able to contact a pharaoh, as you would call him. The man was small in life experience on your plane, and was what this instrument would call a wanderer. Thus, this mind-body-spirit complex received our communication distortions, and was able to blend his distortions with our own. This young entity had been given a vibratory complex of sound, which vibrated in honor of a prosperous god, as this mind-body complex, which we call instrument for convenience, would call Amun. The entity decided that this name being in honor of one among many gods was not acceptable for inclusion in his vibratory sound complex. Thus, he changed his name to one which honored the sun disk. This distortion, called Aten, was a close distortion to our reality as we understand our own nature of mind-body-spirit complex distortion. However, it does not come totally into alignment with the intended teach learning which was sent. This entity, Akhenaten, became convinced that the vibration of one was the true spiritual vibration and thus decreed the law of one. However, this entity's beliefs were accepted by very few. His priest gave lip service only without the spiritual distortion towards seeking. The peoples continued in their beliefs, when this entity was no longer in this density, again the polarized beliefs in the many gods came into their own and continued so until the one known as Muhammad delivered the peoples into a more intelligible distortion of mind-body-spirit relationships. In another question, I understand previous material that this occurred 75,000 years ago, then it was our third density process evolution began. Can you tell me the history, hitting only the points of development, shall I say, that occurred within the 75,000 years? Any particular times or points where the attempts were made to increase the development of this third density? Ra says, I am Ra. The first attempt to aid your peoples was at the time 75000. This attempt 75,000 years ago has been previously described by us. The next attempt was approximately 5800, 58,000 years ago, continuing for a long period in your measurement with those of Mu, as you call this race, or mind, body, spirit, social complex. The next attempt was long in coming and occurred approximately 13,000 of your years ago when some intelligent information was offered to those of Atlantis. This being of the same type of healing and crystal working of which we have spoken previously. The next attempt was one. 000, 11,000 of your years ago. These are approximations as we are not totally able to process your space time continuum measurement system. This isn't what you call Egypt, and of this we have also spoken. The same beings which came with us returned approximately 3500 zero, zero years later in order to attempt to aid the South American mind body spirit social complex once again. However, the pyramids of those so called cities were not to be used in the appropriate fashion. Therefore, this was not pursued further. 
There was a landing approximately 3000 or 3000 of your years ago in South America, as you call it. There were a few attempts to aid your peoples approximately 2300 years ago, this in the area of Egypt. The remaining part of the cycle, we have never been gone from your fifth dimension and have been working in this last minor cycle to prepare for harvest. Question, was the Egyptian visit of 11,000 years ago the only one where you actually walked the earth? Ross says, I understand your question distorted in the direction of selves rather than other selves. We of the vibratory sound complex, Ra, have walked among you only at that time. So they go on to talk about a variety of different subjects regarding Atlantis and Egypt. The bottom line is understanding the history. Ra visits Egypt and tries to teach the law of one and does not do so well. And the society formed a sort of elite and it worked against the law of one. It's almost a political implication. They were sharing this key knowledge with only the few. And so they left, which I find very interesting. They also, in another channeling, asked about Edgar Casey. Question the Edgar Casey material. Who spoke through Edgar Casey? Ross says no entity spoke through Edgar Casey. In the 14th session, they also asked, where did the information come from that Edgar Casey channeled? Ross says, we have explained before that the intelligent infinity is brought into intelligent energy from eighth density or the octave. The one vibratory sound complex called Edgar used this gateway to view the present, which is not the continuum you experience, but the potential social memory complex of this planetary sphere. The term your peoples have used for this is the Akashic Record, or the Hall of Records. So we now understand from Ra's perspective that Edgar Cayce was channeling the Akashic Record. But Edgar Cayce is just a super fascinating character. We have talked about Edgar Cayce on several episodes, and I've given some of his readings and information on the Akashic Record, as well as his discussion of the Book of Revelation. Edgar Cayce is absolutely fantastic and you can find a ton of information at edgarcasey.org. So on one hand we have the raw material saying that they introduced the law of one. They helped build the Great Pyramid. And then we have the Edgar Cayce material. Edgar Cayce the sleeping prophet who would access the Akashic in these trance-like states very similar to the trance-like state that Carla Ruckert would go into when she would channel raw. So we now have the Edgar Casey material, and he's talking about the Law of One, in particular in the history of Atlantis and in Egypt. And we have 125 documents available with a multiple number of readings that refer to the children of the Law of One. And what seemingly is a conflict with a group called the Children of Belial. Who knows exactly the full implications of this without reading some of the material. I'm going to try to read it to you. It's somewhat repetitive. So I'm going to sample some of the different readings from Edgar Casey on these subjects. The point of it is, what is more exciting is this idea that the law of one is mentioned in the Edgar Casey readings and that there is a group called the children of the law of one, which after some additional research I have discovered is discussed in a book called The Children of the Law of One and Edgar Casey. As somebody that wants to get all the information about the Law of One, this fascinates me to no end. I think it's amazing that Edgar Casey was referring to it at this level. Now, it could mean that Carla was influenced by the Edgar Casey readings, and so we're hearing about the Law of One as some sort of subconscious part of Carla if you don't believe the information is channeled. Or you can see this as a confirmation of the Law of One material. About 89% of the time, Edgar Cayce was correct with prophecies and things that he would offer to help people solve diseases. He was not correct all the time, but he referred to the Law of One a ton, especially in giving some specific historical references. The first time we get a reading is in reading 254 of the Edgar Casey material, and it was delivered on January in 1936. We get this particular 
quote from Edgar Casey. In considering the conditions, much must be taken into consideration from the standpoint of the presentation of psychic information, and that as relative to material law. For here you have a situation as has been given of old, where the letter of the law is or has been transgressed, while the spirit of the law that maketh alive is one. Then in meeting the situation, consider that given by him who said that the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Hence the preparation and the handling then must be from material angle and presented from the material as well as from the spiritual angle and that the organization is an ecclesiastical research as well as scientific research organization, not of a sect or set, but as the law of one. In the same reading, he refers to the law of one again, saying, but as set forth or should be set forth in the first premise, the information through this channel is to meet the needs of the individual, is to aid individuals in obtaining help for themselves or for their dependent ones. Through every source, every phrase that is of the law of one, whether it is through this, that, or the other school, or through the spiritual forces within themselves, and these must all work together for good for one. We then get a reference to the law of one from the 262nd session when he says the law of one was manifested in the name Jesus and is signified in the Christ consciousness. In the next reading, there is another reference to the law of one in which it says in entering the present experience, we find the entity as one of those from the Atlantean experience wherein there may come either those very great advancements and instrumental in making for those experiences in the earth through these change periods that are effective for weal or woe, dependent upon the application of self as respecting the creative forces, or then called the law of one. This is in reference to what many of Edgar Casey's readings were, was just an analysis of a particular person and where they had been coming from. We then have a reference in the 315th session by Edgar Casey, where he's talking about a variety of subjects in relation to one particular soul and his journeys in past lives. And he says, the entity was among those that set sail for the Egyptian land, but entered rather into the Pyrenees and what is now the Portuguese, French, and Spanish land. And there still may be seen in the chalk cliffs there in Calais, the activities where the marks of the entity's followers were made as the attempts were set with those to create a temple activity to the father of the law of one. What is amazing is the variety of different references to the law of one. Clearly it was a movement. Clearly it was a historical happenstance. Something significant was happening in the histories of Egypt that dealt with the law of one. And in many of these readings, he's talking about the application of the law of one. There's an implication given in the law of one material that when a civilization reaches understanding of the law of one, it's like the singularity. It's like they reach that point where they completely transcend and their technologies change. It's my belief that once we come into contact with the true nature of the law of one, then we're able to do these amazing things. Travel faster than the speed of light, shrink down to a quantum size, fly, all the abilities that you can imagine. So it's a really big thing. And this stuff might have been happening, especially during Atlantis period and was influenced. People saw amazing miracles happening. There's another one where they're talking about someone else in particular in a temple. And they say, then in the name of Nipsu, the entity who is the person that's asking a question gained throughout the experience and in the presence through the application of the tenets of the law of one that may be found in seeking the ways presented through closer associations with those in the active field of such endeavors, even as in that period, the entity may gain much for self that may bring contentment in the daily activities, which is the greater blessing that may be the lot of any soul in an earth's experience. And the ways are led by the ideal or the guiding influences of an entity, a soul's life. I could keep on going with the law of one references the principles of the law of one, the application of the law of one, the history of the law of one. But there's a reference in the history of Atlantis that they were 
disputing with the children of Belial. And here we get one of the first references to this before the children of the law of one are mentioned. And in this reference on the 470th reading where he's going over some history with Atlantis, he says, And there were those who, with the entity and its associates or companions, who left the activities to engage in the building up of the activities in the Peruvian land. For the Atlanteans were becoming decadent or being broken up owing to the disputes between the children of the law of one and the children of Belial. In the Peruvian or Inca land, we find the entities disturbing forces came when there were too many beautiful women in a part of the activity, yet this did not prevent the entity using or giving to those of the land so much of the gold, the copper, the various metals, especially gold, as the foundation for a portion of the activity during those experiences. There's not really a vast comprehension of the law of one and its principles in the way that Edgar Cayce would deliver these specifically, but we can still learn some more from it. For instance, in the 524th session by Edgar Cayce, he is asked a question, just what in the present are the material urges and desires from the Atlantean incarnation? Somebody saying, I have these desires and urges. What does it have to do with my Atlantean incarnation? And Casey answers, as has ever been indicated from the Atlantean experiences that have been made for the extremist, either in fields of self-exaltation or of the glorifying of the law of one. Hence, as in that experience, the warning for this entity would be, knowing what thou hast believed, knowing it is able to keep that committed unto it against any experience that it brings for self places of trust, places of the ability to meet, to contact, to have put into thine keeping places and positions of trust is as the innate urge, the purpose of the activity. What wilt thou do with these opportunities? Use them for self or for the glory of the maker. In many of these discussions, we start to see a resonance with the raw material in that the children of the law of one and the law of one was about a transcending of the self and letting go of the ego and an application of service to others as he would refer to the glory of thy maker instead of focusing upon thyself. And there is a number of discussions in these materials that are tangentially related to the law of one that talk about this movement towards service. There's also a number of different priests and people that are identified that were priests in the law of one. And you get an idea of the history of how this group developed. We have more of the discussion of the children of the law of one. Also, when I look up the exact phrase of the children of the law of one, it just, there's so much that's discussed and referred to as the children of the law of one by Edgar Casey. For instance, one session from the 877 session says, then we find the entity known as, or called 877. So they would always identify the people uh, as eight, as a certain number or something. So in this one, the other group, those who follow the law, one had a standard. The sons of Belial had no standard save of self, self-aggrandizement. So the sons of Belial are clearly the service to self. Those entities that were then producers or the laborers, the farmers, or the artisans, or those who were in the positions of what we call in the present just machines were those that were projections of the individual activity of the group. Then we find the entity known as are called 877 was among the children of the law of one entering through the natural sources that have been considered in this period as the means of establishing a family. However, they were rather as a group than as an individual family for those who were of the ruling forces were able to by choice to create or bring about or make the channel for the entrance or the projection of an entity or soul as the period of necessity arose in another channeling on the children of the law of one. And I don't know if you call these channelings or readings, but that's probably what you could call it. There is a reference to the children of the law of one. It is said that before this entity was in the land of the present nativity among the peoples of this particular land, when there were the incomings of the others that made greater changes that were coming about in the experiences, not only of those people, but a returning and a making for the activities through the children of Belial that escaped to the land and the children of the law one that were coming again into the closer relationships and contacts with these through material things. There's so much more that I could identify. A lot of it is very repetitive, 
but I wanted to identify that in these readings, it's just not once or twice. In fact, I found over 2,000 different references to the Law of One and 1,500 different re references to the children of the Law of One in the Edgar Casey readings. So we know that he was talking about a specific group that was spiritual in nature, that held secrets, that applied these secrets, that was in battle with another group that essentially was service to self. Sounds familiar. Sounds a lot like what we're going through right now in relation to Ra. It's an interesting coincidence. One of the interesting or fascinating things about the Edgar Casey material, he predicts someone named John Peniel would write a book that would be this amazing book that would change our spiritual understandings. There is someone named John Peniel who actually wrote a book. He even references himself in the book uh, and says that I haven't read the Edgar Casey material, just um, vaguely familiar with it, but I am a member of a group that is called the Children of the Law of One and has been taught and learned from this group from a long age. So I recommend that you check out Edgar Casey, The Children of the Law of One and the Lost Teachings of Atlantis. This book will blow your mind and has a variety of different exercises. In the second half of the book, in his discussion of the children of the Law of One, he explains the children of the Law of One and the Edgar Casey readings. The author of this book and I are both priests, monks of an obscure spiritual order called the Children of the Law of One. The famous unique psychic Edgar Casey referred to our order in a number of his many psychic readings. Some of the information we present in this book apparently confirms information in those readings. While this attests to Casey's remarkable abilities, we are not experts on his readings, and thus cannot guarantee that everything here will be in agreement with them and vice versa. But from what we do know of them, and what we have heard from people who are very familiar with Casey, this book substantiates his readings, enhances understandings of them, and offers new ways to apply the spiritual principles spoken of in them. Apparently, the teachings in his book may also be the fulfillment of his prophecy that a John Peniel would bring to the world a message about the new spiritual order of things around 1998, the year this book was first published. Before this book was published, we are unaware of this prophecy. We attempted to publish anonymously, but were told certain distributors and chain stores wouldn't carry the book unless we put the author's name on it, so we relented. Shortly afterwards, we began hearing from members of an association founded by Casey, the Association for Research and Enlightenment, telling us about the prophecy. Many, after reading the book, they were sure there was the fulfillment of it. Peniel explains that the name of our order is unfamiliar and odd to most people. One reason is that we have deliberately avoided public notoriety, generally preferring to live and work in peace, undisturbed behind the scenes. The Dark Ages are still with us, despite what history books say. Sometimes specific members become famous, but only when necessary for their work or unavoidable. Another reason the name sounds odd is because of its obscure and foreign origins. The name of the order was originally expressed as one concept and can only really be understood as a whole, but breaking it down may help you understand it better. Just try to keep this paradox in mind. The name means many things, but only one thing. The first part, the children of, relates to us being children in the sense of subordinates of God, which we call the universal spirit, obedient to God and universal law. The end part, one, essentially means God rather than a giant silver-haired man in the sky. We consider God to be the totality of everything that exists, the universe itself. Even thus, God is the one. The middle part of the name, the law of, comes from the fact that within the one there are universal laws that govern the operation and function of everything in the universe applying to all things, all vibration, physical or spiritual. Put this all back together again, the children of the law of one that essentially means those who obey universal law and serve universal spirit. Thus something that is very important in our opinion is being in harmony with one and a servant of God. The primary key to that is loving unselfishly. Peniel says, the rule of loving others unselfishly is sometimes called the golden rule. Many individuals and religions believe in the same concept. It was even the only commandment given by Jesus, and the way he said people would identify his followers, i.e. true Christians, would be recognized by loving others as Jesus did. 
unfortunately the golden rule is seldom lived by or focused on. It's often overlooked and not given the major significance it deserves. Throughout history, we, the children of the Law of One and branches of our order, were sometimes known to various cultures by other names. But generally unknown to the masses working behind the scenes, we provide inspiration and education that nourishes the best in humankind, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, and physically. It may take the form of the arts, the sciences, spiritual or political philosophy, but in all cases we bring some form of light into a world of darkness. Thus some of our initiates have been known as scientists, artists, spiritual leaders, unusual political representatives and freedom fighters. Anywhere and any way we can promote spirituality through unselfish love and a return to oneness, we do. Sometimes the name of our order or one of its branches is stolen and used by others with a dark agenda. Sometimes even the teachings are taken and twisted to serve their purposes. In their supreme selfishness, the greedy have used our names and corrupted our teachings in the pursuit of money, pleasure, power, and even world domination. I'm sure many of you can see how Jesus' name has been abused to mislead people. This also happened with the name of the Great White Brotherhood. Now, there are also those abusing the name of the children of the Law of One. You will know the true children of the Law of One by our emphasis on unselfish love and freedom rather than on spiritual knowledge, secret information, power, or phenomenon. Let the universal spirit, your inner voice, be your guide, lest you fall into the beautiful traps of darkness. Initiates of our order have been dedicated spiritual caretakers of humanity since human life began. We've always been vigorous proponents of truth, freedom, justice, and compassion. Our teachings and ways have been carefully preserved and passed down directly from teacher to student. This has continued as an unbroken chain using all means, including reincarnation. You may or may not believe in reincarnation, but does it really matter that much if we care about each other, are good to each other, and follow the golden rule in our lives? It doesn't matter to me whether you believe in reincarnation or not, and I hope it also doesn't matter to you whether I do or not. You may have heard how one famous Buddhist spiritual leader of our times, the Dalai Lama, continues to reincarnate repeatedly taking the same position in life serving as a teacher and leader of the people of Tibet and of Tibetan Buddhism. This one enlightened being has now been reincarnated over a dozen times as the Dalai Lama. This practice is not exclusive to Buddhism. Enlightened teachers of the children of the Law of One also continue to reincarnate, although they usually choose different bodies and positions in life for various reasons. Some of our order have been called ascended masters, saints who have passed on, but many actually continue to reincarnate in physical bodies to directly aid the people of the world. While many people believe that ascended masters or saints are the highest or greatest beings, those who choose to come back to earth rather than ascend pay the greatest price. Their continued reincarnation is a painful sacrifice that they make for all of us, including you. These loving beings making this sacrifice so that those who wake up crying in the dark and desperately reaching out for God will have a someone to take their hand and help guide their way. In order to serve those who need our help, there have always been approximately a thousand initiate monks on the earth at any given time, but as you will later read at the time of this writing, there are but a few hundred. Some live monastically, while others live amongst the people of your world. Most go about their work quietly, often unnoticed. Even though we usually strive for anonymity, many gained historical recognition. They've been known as saints, sages, founders of religion, scientists, inventors, teachers, artists, writers, musicians, philosophers, magi, and even some as the founding fathers of the United States. But whatever their undertaking or parent profession, they have a common earmark. They always promote and exemplify unselfish love, oneness, and freedom, and are at odds with the instigators of selfishness, hate, separation, oppression, and slavery. Leadership within the children of law one is based on and determined by an individual's consciousness or level of spiritual development. Thus, the most humble and most self-sacrificing are the highest ranking and powerful leaders of the children of the Law of One. These beings have always had the most positive influence on the world throughout history. 
the being was known in one of his lifetimes as Jesus, is an excellent example of this. Known also by other names throughout history, he was our Grand Master, the foremost leader of the children of the Law One throughout the ages. His example of strength through self-discipline, caring, and unselfish love spread a message throughout the world, a message he knew would only get told throughout the world if he made the ultimate self-sacrifice. Unfortunately, after his spiritual ascension, greedy man began to misrepresent his words and deeds, use his name and edited parts of his teachings in order to gain power and even justify harm and wealth. Like the Grand Master, all but one of the old ones, the earliest ancient leaders of the children of Law One have passed beyond the physical plane and chosen to no longer be incarnate with us here on Earth. And the current period of this cycle of Earth draws to a close. He's making the ancient teachings available to the public for the first time to provide a candle in the window. Now, this is a very fascinating book that has a ton of information on it, including a chapter on the history of the children of the Law of One. According to the book, there is an actual account of creation by this order, the children of the Law of One, that mentions Belial. Remember, from the Edgar Cayce material, we have the conflict between the children of Belial and the Law of One. This question was also asked of Jim McCarty in several interviews about this seeming synchronicity between the Edgar Cayce material and the raw material. So then this new book, which talks about the children of the Law of One with inside knowledge, has this story. So I wanted to finish this by reading this story, which is super powerful and will resonate with you. Peniel explains that this was written as an account of creation passed down by spiritual ancestors throughout time since the beginnings on Earth. The adepts who transferred it to their students, who became adepts who transferred it to their students, have created a chain throughout history, a lineage of knowledge connecting us directly to our universal source. I give this to you here as it was given to me, as it was given to my personal teacher, Peniel says. Know your true self, and you will know the true story. Know your whole self, and you will know the wholeness of the truth. All is one. There is no other. Thus, it always was, and thus, it always shall remain. We once experienced only oneness, one being with no divisions or separate parts. There was no time, no space, nothing other than the us. When you are only one, there is only you, nothing else to interact with. In order to experience interaction, to experience being with someone else, to experience play, the one divided within itself, duplicating the one, thus creating many ones, many beings within the one. Still one being now in many parts were we, capable of pretending to be the other than the one, while still being one in harmonious consciousness. By vibration was it done, division, multiplication, and expansion of the one, set into motion were vibrations throughout the universe. On it went dividing, multiplying, creating new aspects of vibration through the overtones of harmony and ripples of the interacting vibratory reflections, created this many new things and also initiated the time and space. Each of us were the entity of the one, the entirety of the one, the dark, the light, the stars, the planets, all of us macrocosms of the one. In clusters, groups, we were in all directions, we being the entire universe, we then roamed ourselves as consciousness, as beings that cannot be described or understood by the present earth consciousness, yet describe I will try as best I can. Our existence was as close as you can comprehend in your present consciousness as beings of spirit energy, Light, star groups, solar systems, the groups that be the foundation of the vibratory frequency in creating the physical plane of matter, the appearances there, and that which forms the bodies of that plane, unattached, ever flowing with the flows of the universal one, were we enjoying all the wonders of our new creation. 
our consciousness both semi-separate from yet still one with the entire creation of the universe allowed us the experiencing of new and different things. But within this new creation were the material planes. These were the realms in which existed the most dense or slowest spectrum of vibrations. There were many material planes throughout the universe, the earth being just one. The story I'm about to tell is only of those who manifested in the realm of the earth, but others of us manifested in the material planes of other solar systems. Some are now of the higher consciousness. Kindred beings are they from other worlds, but some from other worlds are of the selfish and evil. When we came upon the world of the earth, we had no comparison, no experience of the like, no expectation of what would be. The first group of us to discover this material plane were in awe of the new sensations it offered. This first group or first wave of souls to materialize was the first to enter the vibrational spectrum of matter in the time space of the earth. They experienced such pleasure from playing in it. They projected themselves deeply into matter in thought forms that were the most stimulating, the most sensational, those of the animal realm creations. In creating these bodies, assorted aspects of different animals were often combined to achieve what they thought would be very desirable blends. Bird head human bodies, Norse body human head, goat head human body, fish tail human torso, and many, many more variations. Unfortunately, these ones our close kindred had no way of knowing that as soon as they hardened their thought forms into matter, becoming these creatures that they would lose all awareness, all consciousness of most things beyond their new bodies and their immediate environment. They became trapped in these forms. The seven parts or chakras were closely cutting off their contact of the full vibrational spectrum and thus all their perceptions and interactions were thus based only on the limited vibrations they could detect through only five vibrational senses. These five senses could only monitor very limited frequency bounds of the full universal vibrational spectrum. And even in that they focused on only those vibrations relevant to the material plane of existence, leaving these human animals without any senses of the spiritual planes of existence. Cut off from the consciousness of the one and thus the very universe itself, the human animals, experienced animal consciousness, but the beings inhabiting these forms were not animals and originally of angelic consciousness. The combination of the consciousness that was meant to be of a higher form blended with the animal consciousness was a very inharmonious and disruptive mix. They lost the purity of animal consciousness and the purity of spiritual consciousness, so this was a new kind of consciousness that was foreign to the animal realm. This new consciousness was separate consciousness and was of a fixed focus nature and reverse polarity in comparison to the consciousness of the one. Intelligence was also severely curtailed in the human animals being similar to the intelligence of the types of animals They were modeled upon, but again, this was adversely afflicted by the negative effects of separate consciousness. Thus were the human animals stuck in this limited plane in limited forms with limited intelligence and a new limited consciousness. They didn't fit in anywhere. They didn't belong in the spiritual realms any longer, nor did they belong in Earth's nature. Thus their introduction into the Earth plane was also disruptive and polluting to the very flow of nature. Those of us who did not project ourselves into matter were quite aware of the predicament and fates that had befallen our kin. From the vantage point of our natural etheric state of existence, we were still of one mind, one being, seeing part of us in such matter-bound prisons as the human animals had become trapped in was very painful. After all, the creatures were us, were our sister brothers, and their misfortune was our misfortune. In the terminology of some, they might also be called the first fallen angels, but they fell not of ill intent, but by virtue of ignorance of the purest kind. We decided to save them 
no matter what the cost. We knew we could only do this if we could function on the same vibratory plane as they. So we too projected ourselves into thought forms that could function within the realms of the Earth Mother. Led by the great being who became known as the Atlantean Amolias, then known later as Thot, and as eventually well known as Jesus much later, the second wave of our entering into the plains of the Earth Mother began. Careful to stay as beings free from the lower vibratory planes or hardening into the matter, we projected ourselves into the material plane with thought form bodies that were semi-etheric, matter but not matter. Thus were we still able to function on all vibrational frequencies of the universal spectrum, free to enter or leave the limited spectrum of the material plane at will. But most importantly, we were very intent upon maintaining our consciousness of oneness so that we would not fall to the same fate of the human animals. The manifestation was achieved more or less successfully, and as we become subject to the vibratory condition which affect this realm, we saw the numerological representations of the physical plane 2 and 5 appear in many aspects of our manifestation. For example, the beginnings of the five races occurred, and later the two sexes, each being having five appendages, two legs, two arms, one head, with two eyes, two ears, two legs, two of many organs, and five fingers, toes on the arms and legs. Despite our precautions and great efforts, some of us still fared not as well as others, losing more consciousness and hardening more than others. Those who manifested in Atlantis with Amelius fared the best, but for many this was to be short-lived. Until this time we were composite beings, macrocosms of the one. Our bodies were not as they are now. Our male and female elements had not yet separated. As composite beings, we each had one body that contained both sexes rather than the male and female bodies we have now. The sexes then being just the inner and outer elements and our outflowing and inflowing parts of the whole being, those were soulmate groups as they are called now. Each composite being had different numbers of parts and different number of soulmates, each part of being itself but fully as one with the whole being. We were like beings in which planets orbit a star or the atoms of matter in which elements of different polarity, male and female, are attracted to each other, finding a plane where they harmoniously function together within the whole as one entity, one being. As such composite beings, we existed in a state of unselfish love, constant flow, overflowing, giving fully of our life energies to each element of ourselves within ourselves and receiving within ourselves and without in our relationship with the one with each composite being also orbited creating the even greater ultimate composite being of the one now for the first time some of us had begun to separate within ourselves manifesting as individual bodies representing the polarity elements Bodies of opposite polarities then came into existence, male or female, sex. The work of freeing the human animals began. It was arduous and complex, but it proceeded. Well, at first, unfortunately, the contamination of separateness slowly began to creep in. We started slowly tasting many of the things that had instantly trapped the human animals. Divisions began to occur between Atlanteans over opinions and desires. The next symptoms of our disintegration was upon us, and this disease would eventually bring down Atlantis. Even in this higher state of manifestation, which we thought would keep us safe from the loss of consciousness that plagued the human animals, some of us succumbed to the lure of material sensation. Like the drug addict would behave with an unlimited supply of drugs, we began to delve more into the indulgences of this plane until we were lost in it, drowning in it. In the frenzy of our addiction to physical sensations, we disregarded all our precautions and wariness. Soon our thoughts and actions had collected matter from this material world that surrounded us and hardened our thought forms, making us matter-bound also. Our consciousness simultaneously slipped, and our gradual loss of consciousness of oneness gave way to the new consciousness of predominant separateness. Consciousness of predominant separateness was foreign to us, a totally new experience. And along with this new consciousness came new emotions, some pleasurable, 
and some painful, strange new things like greed, envy, lust, excitement, fear, and desire. Some of us vigorously strive to maintain a semblance of our consciousness of oneness along with the new consciousness and we were able to experience the emotions without being ruled by them. Such were the children of the law of one. But others lost or chose to deliberately suppress even a glimmer of awareness of the one. These beings became lost and enmeshed in separateness. Outside of the consciousness of oneness, they became subject to being tossed to and fro by the tides of emotional onslaught and ultimately became devoted to personal power and pleasure in this physical plane. These beings became known as the sons of Belial, even if they were female. Take heed of the ancient warnings and prophecies about the Belialians. Lizard-like are they, not in apparent physical description, but in spirit form, in the heart, in the soul. Beware even now of your lizard kin, for they rule the world with greed and without compassion, while maintaining appearance of good and righteousness. As men and women do these, sons of Belial walk the earth, model citizens, successful leaders who are the envy of the uninitiated. While some appear disquieting and strange to the eye, look not to see the ugliness of the Belialians with your eye, for some are handsome to the eye. See, you will not their true lizard-like appearance with your earthly eyes. See their true nature, you will only with the inner eye or in the glimpses from the corner of the eye. When this division came within the people of Atlantis, many things when awry and turmoil began. To function harmoniously, beings need to have omnipresence. Their vision must include the whole picture. But when the attention is fixed and focused in the reverse polarity of separation, all that is seen are parts of the whole picture. Those parts that are not filtered out by the illusions of separate consciousness. It is a limited view at best and often is a lens distorted by emotions without awareness of the whole picture and the guidance of a coordinating force actions become uncoordinated with others to understand this better imagine how well your present day body would function if each limb did not have awareness of what the other limbs were trying to do or if each limb wanted to do different things from each other no longer working together as one now imagine further Imagine this lack of coordination keeping your eyes, ears, fingers, tongue, and mouth from working together as a team. Now consider the chaos and eventual destruction that would occur if every single cell in your body operated with no unifying guiding force that keeps them coordinated with the whole. In fact, that's what cancer is. This became the problem with our very lives once some of us lost connection and consciousness of the one. Such uncoordinated, independent activity becomes logical evolution when such separation occurs and one is left with only an awareness of separateness. Thus it came to be that the two Atlantean socio-political groups evolved with one very essential difference. The children had a consciousness of both separateness and oneness. The Belialians rejected the consciousness of oneness entirely and maintained only a consciousness of separateness. The differences of opinion between the two groups were great and many, including environmental issues, but nothing was more of an issue than the morality of how the humanimals were to be dealt with. Those of the law of one remembering still that we originally came to this plane just to help release the humanimals from matter bondage continued trying to free our trapped siblings. The kindred also created ways known to the initiate to aid in the maintenance of of the consciousness of oneness so we would never lose sight of our goals. But the Belialians wanted to use the humanimals for their own comforts and pleasures. Since those of us from the second wave were of greater consciousness than the humanimals and could still function on higher planes to some extent, we had powers of the mind both spiritual and psychological that made it easy for us to control humanimals. The children refused to use their abilities to control the humanimals, while the Belialians relished the power and wanted to use them as slaves. The other great division in opinion between the children and the Belialians was over the environment as it is called now. 
The Belialians used methods of generating power like electrical power that were dangerous and destructive to the earth. Thus did the great conflict between the children and the Belialians of Atlantis begin. A conflict between light and dark, between selfishness and unselfish love, and the conflict that was continued throughout history and continues to this day. The Belialians' lust for power and lack of care or awareness of the balances of nature led to the destruction of Atlantis. This was in due in great part to the abuse of their power generation plants. When the final destructions occurred, Grand Master Thote then led us to the land of Chem to complete the great works of evolving the human animals as gods were to the people of Chem, and yea, did they think of the human animals to be gods, and so it was done. The human animals were brought to human levels to choose their path from there, yet there are the residual effects. Have you not seen the humans that look much like pigs or goats or th that animal still? These were they. But even though the human animals were no more, the Belialians had not lost their taste for slavery. Thus, the great conflict with the Belialians was far from over and still continues on with the children of the Law of One as lamps illuminating the path of unselfish love, helping the lost find their way home to their spiritual heritage of the One and to find freedom, while the disguised sons of Belial and their pawns do everything possible to maintain their decadence and power and maintain slavery, whether it be direct or by means of livelihood and social control. And they seek to destroy all those who shine light into the world of darkness. All those who do not actively work for the light are varying degrees pawns of the Belialian darkness. So we can see resonance from this story to the same things that are talked about in the Law of One material as there being a battle between service to self and service to others. The Orion interest is the same as the Belial the reason I just find this so interesting is the story itself is very reminiscent of what we've heard with the Law of One material. And it really tells a story that I feel is deep within the history of humanity, this battle between selfish and unselfish. We see it all the time. We see factors at play and elites at play, and it's played out over and over again. And we can see a little bit of that in our history. You can see it in the Bible in Deuteronomy. It says, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. In Judgments 19, they say, Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house. The old man saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. There are several other references to these children of Belial. It's just an interesting coincidence. But Edgar Cayce was most of the time correct. Nine out of ten times he was correct. So when we look back on these old readings where he was touching on the Akashic Record, which is not a perfect science, he was telling the story of our history, especially in Egypt, and the influence of the Law of One that's going much further than we get in the raw material. We know that it was a part of the history, but we know there are forces still at play that are utilizing these teachings of the Law of One that are a fundamental part of our soul and where we exist and our consciousness today. So it's an interesting coincidence. It's an interesting linkage between two bits of information. And I simply present it to you, take of it what you will. In many ways, it affirms the authenticity of the raw material or it could just be a simple coincidence take of it what you will and take more of this information i recommend you go to edgarcasey.org and see if you can find additional information that you may come to light now many people that are starting to remember their past lives are remembering experiences both from atlantis and in egypt it's a very common thing and i have an episode i don't know if i posted it yet uh where this is discussed by Rudolf Steiner. A lot of the things that we're going through are because of our experiences with those two cultures. And a fundamental part of it was the law of one. 
that could have been the result of the war that went on in Atlantis, the end of the world, who knows, but we're part of the next stage, a more advanced understanding of the law of one because of perhaps the technology and the system that we're in, we can transcend a lot of the conflicts that happened in the past. Once we truly come into our power, which they're trying to stop us from doing anything is possible. And we come into an understanding of the one, the essence of the one. We also come into an understanding of power, which we can use to help those souls be freed that are freed from their locked in prison, like consciousness on this planet into what they were meant to be bodies of light. So I'd love to get your impressions of this material so far. There's certainly something we will definitely explore in the future as I love Edgar Casey and I love the law of one couldn't help, but do an episode on this. In any case, all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. and welcome to the reality revolution. <laughs>